Word nerd. Wordsmith. Wordy. Wordless. Oxford Dictionary says a word is a single, distinct, meaningful element of speech or writing, used with others or sometimes alone. We say each one matters. No extra words is literature, minimalist style. And we're getting you right to the story. An Ode to Rejection by Marlene Woods A brief letter from the journal I submitted poetry to upends my heart. Two possibilities, selection or rejection. My hand trembles. Is it a yay or a nay? I smile for what if. What if they did love my poetry collection? Praising it as an exception, I linger. But what if not? I'll be heartbroken, fictionally stabbed, and left uninspired for a while. I open it, and my name is in far distance from the winner. Oh, rejection. You grant me a sweet depression. Thank you, dear rejection. Do remember that some day persistence will let me win, and you will be nothing but a distant memory to me. Hello there! Welcome to No Extra Words, One Person's Search for Story. My name is Chris Baker Dersh. I'm your producer and editor. As happens so often, this episode is not what I envisioned it to be when I first started planning it. I hope that means it's better <laughs> than it was. Um, we are celebrating today, and we should celebrate today because, wow, 100 episodes. This feels like a huge deal. Two and a half years of podcasting, 100 regular episodes, 18 special episodes, 212 contributors, 47 of them have shared their words with us more than once. Two of them have been here six times. So much to celebrate, so much to talk about. I don't know how to squeeze it all in. I envisioned this episode when I first started planning it as a love letter to writers. And we are going to do some of that because I received some fabulous feedback. Um, but some other things happened, and I want to bring those to you as well. And one of the special things that happened was I stumbled upon this week the wonderful poem by Marlene Woods that kicked us off. Marlene and I actually belong to a writer's group together on Facebook. It is the I Am a Writer group facilitated by Sarah Werner. It's part of her podcast, the Right Now podcast. Marlene got a tough rejection letter last week and wrote this poem as her way of moving on from that and shared it in the group. And as soon as I read it, I said, I want that for the podcast. And she was kind enough to give me permission to share it. I have sent, I looked up today, 209 acceptances for work from the slush pile in the year, two and a half years we've been taking submissions for season one and sent 349 rejections. And while getting rejections is a lot harder than sending them, I can tell you neither one is super easy. And somehow Marlene's poems seemed a way better way to acknowledge the wonderful writers who've been part of No Extra Words than any sort of rambling that I could do about how grateful I am for them. So thank you, Marlene, for that, for kicking us off. I'm going to get to some other listener feedback and some other remember whens from the show in just a little bit. But before I do that, I have two special guests today who came and sat with me in studio to talk about books and to share their stories. And I want to bring you the first of two extremely special guests, very important to the show. Please stay tuned. Tell the people your name. I am James. James, how old are you, James? Three. Three. And James brought some special books into the studio today to tell us about his favorite books. Do you want to grab one of your favorite books and talk about it? Okay. So what is this one? That one is called Pocket Full of Nonsense by James Marshall. It's Pocket Full of Nonsense. What do you like about this book, James? I like you have to tell the people they can't see. So you have to tell them. I like this. Who's there? Who's who's in this book? This guy and this guy. Why is there gum on 
and on his bed. There's gum on his bed. Oh my goodness. There's a bunch of silly pictures in this book, aren't there? All right, grab another book, James. I, I asked James to bring three books to the studio and he chose five because he's a book lover. Oh, this one. Do you remember what this one is called? Talk right in the microphone. It's, no, it's not a box. It is not a box. And what is this book about? He's wearing a box. Yeah. Does he do all kinds of fun things with boxes? Yeah. Does he like go to outer space and stuff? Yep. Okay, grab another book, James. And this is the squid book. Who bought you the squid book? Auntie Molly. And the squid book is new, right? And the squid book is new. It's always good to have new books. What do we like about the squid book? What color is the squid, James? Red. He's like bright pink. He's pretty cool looking. This book is actually President Squid, in which the squid runs for President of the United States. It's very silly. But, um, but then he gets, but then he gets to be king. He gets to be king? Clearly I have not read to the end of this book. Okay, James, grab another book. And this is the baseball player book. Oh, the baseball player book. It's very important to James to have baseball players in his book. Why did you pick this baseball book instead of a different baseball book? What's special about this one? This one. This. A little guy. There's a little cartoon guy who narrates this book. Okay, last one. What's the last book you brought to us today? A dinosaur one. Oh, well, it's good. We got a baseball book and a dinosaur book and a book about squids. How could we possibly go wrong? Ooh, this book is actually one I you like now, but I think you're going to like it a lot more as you get bigger and bigger. What do you like about this book, James? Use words. This. Okay, what is the, that? A dinosaur. A dinosaur. There are some really cool pictures of dinosaurs in here. Anything else you want to tell the people about this book? No. Nope. So you said you wanted to talk about some things that weren't books. Is there anything else that you want to say today? This is a cuddly thing. Yeah, are you exploring all the stuff in Mama's office? It's cuddling. Hey, James, should people listen to Mama on her podcast? Yep. Yeah, why? Because she should. Is there anything else that you want to say? No. Do you want to come say bye-bye to the microphone? Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That was not James's first appearance on the show, and I couldn't somehow envision celebrating episode 100 without him because he's been a big part of what has gone on here. So I'm glad he joined me in studio. I have another special guest coming who's going to kind of round us out before we go talk about the future of No Extra Words. But before we do that, I do want to share with you, I had two former contributors to the show did respond to my call to talk about writers whose words have touched them. The first was Adam Kluger. Um, Adam Kluger has been on the show a number of times. In addition to being an author, he is uh, a guy who really works in sound. And so he's provided some great voices and great audio editing to his contributions to the show. And he actually has a three ebook series um, available on Amazon that are il um, illustrated flash fiction inspired by his literary heroes. And I just want to read a couple of excerpts from an interview that he did about the series, talking about why he chose the particular heroes he chose. He talks about Bukowski. Um, why Bukowski? There are a lot of reasons. The humor, the honesty, the accessibility. When you find a writer that speaks to you, like music, you just really appreciate it. And has an interesting phrase. He was asked, what is guide lit? And the answer is a label. People come up with labels. Who knows why? The truth of the matter is that Desperate Times, which is his book, Adam Kluger's book, is simply a collection of flash fiction and short stories about male protagonists who find themselves facing various conflicts. And I think that's really well spoken about these categories literature falls into, that at the end of the day, we're all doing it different ways, but we're really just telling stories. So thank you, Adam, for sharing your words. Um, please check out Adam's Desperate Time series. I will put a link to that in the show notes, as well as to Adam's former contributions to our show, so you can take a listen back. The other one that I received was from Francis D. Clemente, and he and I share a favorite writer, and I'm going to read you his what he sent to me in its entirety. 
The writer who inspired me the most was Langston Hughes. I came under his spell while living in Phoenix, Arizona several years ago. I was working as a news editor for a wire service and wanted to do some creative writing on the side. Since I lacked time, when I wrote about the musings in my head or the scenes I had encountered in my daily life, the words took the form of verse, often scribbled while sitting in my car, in my office, or apartment parking lot at the end of my night shift. A lot of this poetry was just plain bad. Some of these poems later made it into my published books after much revision. During this time, I bought a copy of Selected Poems of Langston Hughes, and the contents cracked open my understanding about the nature of poetry. I also liked the cover photo of Hughes sitting in front of his typewriter and looking over his left shoulder. Hughes showed me that poetry was not the exclusive domain of academics and intellectuals with MFA degrees. His pithy poems, written in the vernacular, delivered an emotional punch. And while he often addressed the racial injustice of the Jim Crow era, Hughes' poems also tackled universal themes and longings, such as poverty, weariness, dreams, loneliness, and the struggle for acceptance. Inspired by Hughes, I felt confident to express my poetic voice despite having no formal training in the genre. He also sent me two of his favorite poems by Hughes, which sadly I don't have the rights to share with you. So I will give you titles and make sure I have links to those in the show notes. Um... It's Suicide's Note and Dreams. Regular listeners to the show have heard me talk about Hughes before. Um, He remains one of my all-time favorite poets. And sharing Langston Hughes with students remains one of the highlights of my librarian career. And I think Hughes' poetry is very, very meaningful for our time. So if he's not someone you're familiar with... um, I definitely would start exactly where Francis did with the selected poems of Langston Hughes. And thank you, Francis, for for sharing that. Adam and Francis' words really reminded me how much, and I, I don't know how I can say this without sounding cliched, but how much working with the writers I have worked with here has meant to me and how we as writers sort of carry the legacy of the writers who came before us and... So that means a lot to me to be able to, to share that. Um, There are so many highlights of season one. I don't think I can really go back and do justice for everything that's happened. I'm going to talk about just a few things that I remember off the top of my head. The first and second holiday seasons that I did this show, I broadcast a Christmas serial, which was an original piece. Um, That was a huge leap of faith for me because I had never shared an original piece that was that long. It's a children's book is really what it is. And giving myself a deadline to really rewrite and polish that work and get it out to you all. It was the first really long work like that that I had ever edited for kind of mass consumption. And it still gives me shivers that it's out there. But it is. And sharing that was huge. Um, One of the other highlights that really sticks in my mind is Arden Ren Sawyer was with us as a contributor on episode 53. And following that, Arden wrote a story about their own experience with the show starring me. And not only did I get to play myself in Arden's story when I read it, but I got to see what an impact the show had had on Arden and... That was an incredibly special experience. I shared some of my other highlights with you in December and November, including when I got to take a ferry trip to interview poet Kelly Russell Agadon in her office about what it's like to run a small press. We've had some other great guests on the show. Jim Zabo was with us um, at the Secondhand Stories podcast, and we did a whole conversation about why in the world we use this medium to tell stories. Um, We've had authors come on and talk about themselves and and share themselves with the audience. And so there have just been so many highlights and I could go on and on and I don't want to, but I would be remiss if I ended season one without a look back and a thank you for everything that has happened far more than I ever could have expected. One of the things I love about this medium and doing this this way is everything we've done gets to live on. And new listeners find us all the time. I was thinking about this today as I was getting ready to record. And I just took a look to see on the day that we're recording what has been listened to, what is interesting. And 
The top listened to episode of the day is the most recent one, 99, which makes perfect sense. Um, other more recent episodes are high up there, including 96 from December and 95 from November. But somebody today listened to episode 37 from March of 2016. And somebody listened to our baseball opening day special, second opening day special from April of 2017. And somebody even went way back in the archives and listened to the summer camp episode, which was episode five, the first of many in which we would break format, um, that aired back in July of 2015. So everything we've done lives on and gets to find new ears all the time, which I think is really, really cool. Coming up next, I have one more special guest, a very important person on this show, also came into the studio and sat with me and talked books and all kinds of things. So that is coming your way right now. Stay tuned. And then I will be back at the very end to usher in season two and take us into the future. You're raring to go. All right. Would you like to introduce yourself to the people and tell them who you are and how you got roped into this? Um, so do I use my full name? or You what? can use whatever name you like. My name's Dave. <laughs> All right, my name's Josh, and I, I am the husband of the wonderful podcaster you were listening to here. And how did I manage that. to talk you into this? Do you know? Uh, there were cookies. There were cookies. There still are cookies. You get one when you're done. Oh, good. I'm going to move the microphone a little bit closer to you. Try now. Talk. Hi, I'm talking again. Does this work? <laughs> yes, it works fine. We are officially doing a test of any good relationship today because we are two people, one mic. So there has to be sharing involved. So I, br I asked Josh to bring some books to share because he knows that James was in here and brought some books to share. So before you do that, is there anything you want to tell the people about your life as a reader, how you came to books, what role books have played in your life, anything you want to say about that? Uh, well, I grew up with a librarian for a mom, so my mom would always be bringing books home that she thought I would like, and she... She often brought home a lot of books that I would like, and so I read a lot of books as a kid. Um, and it, as an adult, I find myself reading a lot less than I did. Not for lack of want, just for lack of time. But so does your mom have good taste in books, even now? Does she recommend stuff to you? She hasn't recommended a book to me in a while, no. We should get on her about that. Okay. Um, do you want to share what you brought into studio today? Uh, just go through the ones. Just grab a book and start, and start talking. This is a low-pressure situation. Okay, well, since we were talking about my mom and her book selections, <clears throat> this is one from my childhood. It's uh, The House with the Clock in Its Walls by John Belairs. And um, I was kind of a nerdy kid, and I really liked clocks a lot. Like, I would take them apart and repair them and put them back together. And uh, I guess I still kind of do that. If you ask, ask my <laughs> wife, we might have a few too many clocks in the house. So I have to tell a story about Josh before he goes on about clocks. Before I met Josh, we had an email relationship. And I would try to ask him questions because it's important to draw Josh out of his shell. And I asked him one day, because I'd never seen his house, I said, what's the most decorative, cool decorative thing you have in your house? What's unique about your house? And the response was, I have 27 alarm clocks on my mantle. And I think at the time I thought that was an exaggeration. Yeah. I, I will I will stress that they're not all running at the same time, because that would be really loud. <laughs> yes. So anyway, more about the book. <clears throat> Tell me about the book. Um, I, I can't remember what year. It probably would have been 1988 or 1989, and my mom brought, brought home this book from the library. And it was the first of many John Belair's books that I ended up reading, and I just, I have always liked the way that he wrote, and of course the illustrations are awesome because they're ed by, done by Edward Gorey, which you can't see on the podcast. But I suggest you go look, <laughs> look, look it up because they're, they're, it's got il illustrations and drawings by Edward Gorey, who's super creepy and gothic. And really, I guess you could call the uh, kind of style of the books sort of sort of gothic in style. There, I mean, this this uh, you know this book doesn't uh, pull its punches punches when talking about like uh, magic and mythology. There's sections in here in Latin. Nice. There's, it talks about a hand of glory in here, nice. uh, and 
and uh, you know, there's just it's 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 ultimately creepy. And as a 13 year old kid, no, I would have been I would have been nine or ten at the time. It was it was really engrossing and, and terrifying. And I I reread this earlier, well, last year, late last year, just because uh, I hadn't read it since I was a kid, and it's still it's still really good. I like the way he uh, uh, the author John Belair's writes about writes as a kid like I he I think he has a good grasp of what it's like to be a kid even though it's you know this book was written in uh, let me see here 1973 nice. and it's about a kid growing up in the 50s I feel like there's a lot that you know still resonates um, and uh, it's just really it's scary <laughs> and um, the characters in this book you got uh, uh, Lewis Barnevelt and his, his uncle Jonathan uh, they went on to have other adventures in in other John Belair's books, and there were other uh, pairs of characters. Um, I'm trying to remember. Oh, it's gonna it's gonna drive me nuts. Remember <laughs> the other characters? Um, but there are at least a couple of other pairs of characters who just kind of they they were really odd pairings. Like you know, this is a kid and his uh, his his uncle, um, and then there's another uh, there's a, a kid and his neighbor across the street who's an 80 year old professor. Um, I'm gonna. It's gonna, it's gonna drive me nuts. Not remembering so names. So if you're a kid picking up because I read books. these so many times, it should just be engraved on my brain. Um, but it's just like unlikely pairings of characters going off and having crazy adventures together. I mean, a 12 year old kid and 80 year old professor. They talk about making delicious cakes and then going out and and solving the mystery of a robot that that uh, a pitching robot. Nice. That 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 has been going around murdering people. I mean, come on. That's the that's the eyes of the killer robot, by the way. Uh, okay. That's the name of that one. So, if you're a kid approaching these books now, or an adult, is there one that you should get first? Do they do they go in a certain order? Do they connect together, or do you just grab a John Belair's Other book? Other than and go chronologically, now? I mean, I think there there is definitely some some overlap, and there's a chronology to them. But you can really just pick up any one of them, um, and just and just go go with them, um, and they're they don't they stand on their own. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So, what else did you bring? Um, I didn't look at these, by the way. He just showed up with a stack of books. Well, I didn't get to look at them. I brought uh, A Scanner Darkly by Philip K. Dick. Oh, yeah. Uh, Philip K. Dick is one of my favorite sci-fi authors. He was he was a real character. Um, you know, uh, just wrote pro prolifically for 30 years. Um, and uh, just has the had the craziest, like, ideas. Really all about identity and deception and... And uh, like I don't know, psychotic substances and and just all kinds of crazy stuff. And of course, so much of his stuff was made into feature films. Are there any of them any good? The movies, yeah. Or the books, the bo the movies. Y yeah, I mean, Total Recall is awesome. Uh, that's based on the short story. We can remember it for you wholesale. Uh, that's a better title. The short story has a better title, I think. It's a pretty cool title, and I mean, they couldn't have made a movie that was a direct adaptation of the of the book because because it's so crazy. <laughs> um, I, I, it's been a little while since I read it, so I'm probably going to screw up the synopsis a little bit. But the the synopsis of the movie is Arnold Schwarzenegger goes to have a, a vacation he can't afford uh, at this company called Recall, which specializes in implanting memories. So he pays you know, a few hundred credits, and he gets the memory of going to Mars, which is where he's always wanted to go. Um, but something goes wrong, and they, it's, it screws up. And so he actually thinks that he's a, a, a spy, or maybe he was a spy all along. You, you don't really know, even at the end of the movie, although it's, it's pretty much the fact that he's a spy on Mars. <laughs> but in the short story, um, it turns out that there's a double twist there, and that this memory of him being a spy on Mars is absolutely true, but it was implanted in his memory so he would forget because a a uh, species of super intelligent mice came to the Earth and promised not to destroy the Earth as long as he didn't tell anybody about them. And now he remembers them because because this uh, because because Recall Incorporated screw up, screwed up his memory. So now he remembers the mice, and the mice are going to come back and kill everybody. Again, I feel like that would make a better movie. Maybe it's just me. I don't know. I, I can't imagine. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger having the uh, gravitas to pull that off. Probably not. Probably not. So what Philip K. Dick book did you bring? I, I brought A Scanner Darkly. This was actually made into a movie in 2005 or 2006 uh, with Keanu Reeves and uh, uh, Robert Downey Jr. A couple other guys. 
you know, sure. people. I, I, I'm not, I'm not IMDb. I don't remember. <laughs> uh, but uh, that was uh, Richard Richard Linklater. It was one of his rotoscope ish animated films. Uh, so it was really kind of got a trippy vibe to it, which fits the book well. The book is about a uh, a narcotics officer named Bob Arctor, who uh, in in the distant future of 1994, who sure. who is undercover trying to find the de- the high level dealers of a drug called uh substance d or slow death as it's called and in the process he becomes addicted to the drug and it has an effect on his brain which basically separates the two halves of his brain um and so he's no longer able to uh process information the way he should be able to and so eventually he he ends up uh being told that he's a suspect and that he's supposed to be spying on himself uh, which you know has odd results, um, and it's really it's a it's kind of a an autobiographical ish book because at the time, well, the, what w- this is based on a, a a time in the author's life where he was uh, not having a good time. He had recently been divorced, and he um, had. Um, kind of fallen in with a bad crowd and you been on and off um, methamphetamine uh, I think I read that at one point he claimed to be able to write 60 pages of like finished copy a day while on on amphetamines um, and that might explain some of the, the kind of the craziness of some of his output he was prolific and just wrote the craziest stuff um, so the experiences he had while uh, hanging out with these people and doing these drugs and all these sorts of things got filtered into the book. Um, it's it's got an interesting. Uh, it's just it's an interesting story. It's uh, it's it's well written and. Um, and that particular copy has a really cool cover. Yeah, uh, the author's note in the uh, at the end begins. This has been a novel about some people who were punished entirely for too much for what they did. Wow. Um, so, yeah. That is, that's really cool. It's you, it's fun. Any of Phil K. Dick's stuff is is good. Some of it's a little unapproachable and a little out there. Uh, his short stories, though, I don't think you can go wrong with. Um, and uh, you know, a lot of the short stories were made into movies as well. Uh, um, maybe a little more easy to adapt. Um, yeah. And there are collections of those out there which I recommend. Cool. You brought one more book. I, I I told you like I told James to bring three. You actually brought three. I know so. how to count, <laughs> and I don't. You know, I don't have to remember what things uh, you tell me to do. James is still working on. He knows how to count, but maybe <laughs> listening is not his forte. Um, this is uh, Stephen King's It, which I first read I think when I was thirteen years old. Uh, it took me a while. It's uh, eleven hundred and forty pages. Um, this is after Stephen King no longer required the services of an editor, um, so it's a little <laughs> long. And this is one... I've always admired the way Stephen King can uh, develop characters and settings. Like, you really feel like this the town of Derry, Maine, which is a fictitious town that Stephen King made up from whole cloth for this book and makes appearances in others uh, of his books, but this is the primary Derry, Maine book. You really think that you know if you were to just go go take a tour of Maine, you would end up there, and it's a real town, it's a real place filled with real people. Isn't Stephen King from a small town in Maine? Yeah, everything Stephen King writes is in Maine. Yeah. Um, True confession: the only Stephen King book I've ever read is the memoir that he wrote with a sports writer about following the 2004 Red Sox. So I know he's a New England guy. You need to correct that at some point. I know I do. Um, (laughs) Josh has a stack of Stephen King books for me. This is one I come back to. I've I've reread it probably five or six times in my life. Um, The uh, as a 13 year old, you know, it's about essentially a group of seven kids who get together. Uh, they were kind of, maybe they were drawn together um, by a cosmic force to battle an evil uh, uh, demon or spirit that has haunted the town of Derry, Maine since time immor- immemorial um, and combat it. Um, the, the, the monster preys on the, uh, the, the fears of children and uses it to basically devour them. Um, and it will take the form of whatever is most terrifying to that child. And 
it also has the ability to basically mask its uh, existence. Adults aren't really aware of it, but they can be controlled by it. So it's kind of an undefined monster, although, you know, the the ultimate showdown, it turns into, like, this spider thing, which is kind of lame. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> That's kind of a cop-out. I do actually like the way the book ends, but the actual, con- which is still, like, the actual conflict, the fight with the monster is, let's see here, uh, starts on page 1051, and that means there's still, you know, a hundred pages left before the actual end of the book. Um, but so wait, we we go through a thousand pages of this book before he fights the monster. That's right. Okay. There's actually well, there's actually two fights of the monster because the the book is split into two time periods. One which oh, okay. takes place in 1958, and the other which takes place in 1985. 1985. Because my understanding is the new movie they flipped everything 30 years in the yeah. So it's so. the the past is in the 80s and the okay. the present is uh, the present. Um, eh, whatever. Um, I don't think that explicitly matters, but what the book is really about, uh, is kind of the way children see the world, Mm -hmm. I think. Um, the creativity, the imagination, and so when I read this as a kid, the cool thing was, this is a bunch of, a bunch of kids my age going on this super keen, goony adventure sort of thing, you know, only with, you know, blood and gore and and monsters and... You almost said keen. I did. (laughs) Um... You know, blood and gore and monsters and scary stuff. Um, nothing scared me as a kid, but this, you know, this is still, you know, some really creepy stuff in here, and it's uh, it's pretty cool. And then as an adult, I kind of see more like, you know, I, I look back on it. I remember, you know, the way I read it as a child, and it's like, you know, the book is also talks about the things that you forget as an adult, what it's like to be a kid, and uh, and I think that that rings true as well. You know, the um, the fact that there are things you can't do as an adult that you could as a kid. Um, both physically and mentally. Um, you know, the kids can believe in whatever the heck they want to believe at any time because, you know, they're kids. The adults have more trouble, uh, you know, just not taking things at face value. Um, and it's, um, I don't know, it's, it's got some great characterization. All the characters, you know, feel real to me, um, even with their, you know, weird main accents. And, uh, the setting is, you know, is excellent. You really feel like you know the town, and the town is a character unto itself. Um, and anyone who's read this book in the modern age would probably recognize a particularly problematic section. I'm not going to talk about it here. I think (laughs) Stephen King himself kind of regrets putting that in there. Um, and while I feel, feel like it, if you think about it, it fits thematically with what's going on in the book, but also it's seriously... Seriously gross and doesn't belong in there. So I still think it's a good book. I still reread it. There's there's a couple of pages in there where it's like the, the, Stephen King should have laid off the cocaine just a little bit while he was writing. I feel like anything that you look at from the past has moments that don't. I, I don't. I think even when this was written in the 80s, this would have been problematic. But again, this is a point in his career, 1986, a uh, point in his career where he didn't need, you know, he, no one could edit him anymore. Right. So. You and I have uh, talked about this. That creative any editor people, would have said, "Hey, uh, let's 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 think about removing this." Uh, you know, creative people do better when they have someone around to rein them in, as yeah. as as George Lucas is the prime example. Um, so I think you've missed your calling, and I feel like my job is in danger because I feel like you're going to steal it at any time I, and take over book recommending. I, I, do, I don't think so. No, no one should listen to what I have to say. <laughs> I do have a couple more questions for you. I can tell you want to run away, but I have a couple more questions for you. It may surprise anyone who knows me to know that Josh is really the bedtime story reader around here and probably reads to James at least as much as, if not more, than I do. So I wanted to ask you, favorite, least favorite book to share with James? Um, well, what I like about reading to James is that he, he will just sit there as long as you care to read to him, because he just gets totally engrossed. Um, I, there are, boy, that's, I, I should have, you should have prepared me for this one. I wanted to put you on the spot. <laughs> um, well, least favorite, I think there, there's a tie, um, that, uh, 
12 experiments I'm not allowed to do it, or that failed or oh, okay. I, uh, okay. along with its its original which is like 12 things I'm not allowed to do anymore. I like the original better. <laughs> yeah, the 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 sequel of the 12 experiments that failed is seriously gross. It just grosses me out and I'm not somebody who gets grossed out easily, but that is an al- that book is almost entirely filled of filled with things that are just disgusting for me to think about. Yeah, but, doesn't she mix like different foods together? Yeah, and... there's a whole bunch of that stuff in there and it's just like I catch up on ice cream. Meh. The, the thing with the shoe and the fungus growing in it. Ew, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. come on, this is not. And also, <laughs> he's three. I don't need to. If, even if, he, if 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 it's supposed to be a negative, uh, I don't need to encourage him to do anything. And then the uh, the other one is there's that Joshua and the Bigfoot book, which I think was written by. Um, this is a book about a a kid who really wants to to meet Bigfoot, and he goes on a camping expedition, and sure enough, they he meets Bigfoot, and they go off and have stinky. Or he gets rescued by Bigfoot because he just wanders off from the campsite and gets lost and then Bigfoot finds him. But it reads kind of like propaganda for somebody who wants everyone to believe in Bigfoot. I, I can't quote it because I don't have the book here, but it's seriously weird. It just it just has this weird vibe to it. Like it was written by somebody who's just, just kind of kind of weird. Like, come on, this is the book. We're going to get them, get them young. They're going to believe in Bigfoot. They're going to believe in Big, Bigfoot in this. And then, yeah. Uh, then, then the money starts rolling in. Sure, that book yeah. looks like it's made a lot of money for its creator. I, I, yeah, considering that I, I'm guessing that we have one of five copies in existence in the world. Where did that one come from? Because I didn't buy it. That one is was chosen for us because Bigfoot is my camp name. So it was bought entirely for the title because it's you and me together. Yeah. And because it's, it was it was bought as a novelty gift, and because it. Is a children's book. It ended up in James's room. Yep. Yep. Okay. Well, there's a lot of things that ended up in James's room that are a little weird. Um, <laughs> I was a camp counselor. There's a lot of camp counselor stuff in his room. And my, I guess my my favorite one to read to him, although we don't end up reading it all that long, often because it's long. I always like the Five Hundred Hats of Bartholomew Cubbins by Dr. Seuss. Nice. Um, it's it's long, and I'm not quite sure what the moral is supposed to be because the moral apparently is that if you have a magical hat, the king will like you. Um, <laughs> Best not to read too much. Yeah, I, I, I don't, maybe, it, 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 it's just a story. It's it's an interesting story, and it's one that my dad read to me when I was a kid, and it was read to him when he was a kid. So just kind of passing that along. And James seems to, seems to like it. I always, when I was a kid, I always, when my dad was reading it to me, my dad was, is, was, is a math teacher. He always used to emphasize the numbers in there because there's a lot of just counting because of all the hats, you know. Um, so I always, I always liked that particular part of it. I was kind of nerdy even as a like a five year old. So, um, so I like, I like reading, reading that to him. And uh, yeah, I think it's. And both you and I have done Charlotte's Web with him now. Um, me when he was a teeny tiny little thing that didn't move, and you in more recent. Yeah, Vintage. he really got into that one. He like when, uh, when I read it to him when you know this this past summer. It amazes me how well he sits through even chapter books at three. Yeah. All right, so my last question for you: What did you think when I told you I was going to start a podcast? Um, honestly, I thought I, I thought you were going to have fun with it, and then it, but that it was not going to last nearly as long as it did, and I. <laughs> I think it's amazing that you've stuck with it this long while having to juggle a child and all the things that go with being a stay-at-home mom. It's just a lot of work, and and it's just, I don't know, it's 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 cool. I I, I think at the time I I wasn't wasn't sure how how seriously to take it, and the answer is very seriously. Um, I safe and assuming this is your first ever appearance on a podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Probably, probably, probably the last. <laughs> and, I and will your, never be invited back. Your, no, I, I'll totally invite you back. And your favorite podcast to listen to is? Uh, I, the only podcast I listen to because I, I just I just haven't really gotten in. I, I have only so much time to listen to people shout on the internet about <laughs> things. I really like uh, uh, We Hate Movies because I'm a big fan of bad movies. Um, and they, they, they have a lot of fun just... Dissecting um, movies that are terrible without being shrill about it—that's, I think, the key to it. There are a lot of podcasts and videos where people just get really angry about movies and stuff that are bad, and 
and these guys, these, these are just a bunch of stand-up comedians from New York who are just sitting down and having a good time talking about movies, and they don't take it too seriously, and they don't expect anyone else to take it too seriously, and they have, they have been doing this for, like, 250 episodes or something like that once a week, so they've been doing it for a while, and I respect their opinions on things. Good advice for anyone who puts things on the internet. Don't take it too seriously. Yeah. Is there anything else that you want to say? Um, uh, Sam like, Demas High School Football Rules. I don't know. I'd like to thank you on behalf of the group, and I hope we pass the audition. <laughs> well, thank you for coming, and you'll, you'll get to come back. You, you make almost as good a guest as James, which is a really good compliment. Yeah. You make a better guest than James. Thank you. Okay, so that was the most fun that I've had in a really long time. I don't know which was my highlight for this particular episode. Getting to interview him and realizing he's probably on the verge of stealing my job. Or the phrase Marlene used in her poem that opened us up today, fictionally stabbed. The number of times in my life I've been fictionally stabbed. I can't even tell you. And that is our celebration of a hundred episodes and two and a half years, more than two and a half years, actually. I actually sat down and counted this out, and it is actually two years and eight months, just about exactly, since we launched at the end of May 2015. So I think that actually categorizes us as two and two-thirds of a year, something like that. Such a fun journey we've been on. And I want to close today with a little reflection on where we are going next. I've been hinting at this both here and on our social media for a few weeks now that we are closing out our era of flash fiction, which is true. And it's not without a little bit of regret that I make this decision, but it's time. You know how you sometimes just get a sense that it's time for something In May of 2015, when I launched this podcast, I had a one and a half year old. He wasn't a year and a half. He was just over a year old. And we had just started our golden age of naps, which lasted just about a year. And I had just kind of come out of that, oh my God, I had a baby and became a mom phase of my life and was looking for something to bring me back into the adult world. And this provided me with that and provided me with a lot of things, the inspiration to write more and connections with other writers and with listeners that I needed so desperately at that phase in my life. But life changes, goes on to new and different phases. And it has been well over a year since my now three and a half year old had a consistent nap schedule and interests have shifted. I'm back working in the library now, which I wasn't at that time. And just a lot of things have taken me to a new season of life. And a new season of life seemed to call for a new season of the podcast. Because one thing that I knew for sure, as I was sort of visioning, okay, what do I want to do, is I didn't want to, to not do this. I didn't want to stop coming on the microphone and talking to you wonderful people. And I started kind of visioning what I wanted to do and what I wanted the future to hold. And I had just started in that process when one of my favorite radio programs of all time, The Writer's Almanac, met its untimely end at the end of 2017. I think we should talk at some point about the end of The Writer's Almanac and about what the Me Too movement means to us as we figure out how to put people who we have admired, who we are now seeing fully for their flaws, where in our lives we put them and how we compartmentalize who they are and what they have done and whether we think that taking a body of work down is a good choice or not. That is a very valid conversation to have and I think it would be a great conversation for us to have. Now is not the time for me to try to figure out how I feel about Garrison Keillor in the aftermath of the Writer's Almanac. One thing I do wish is I wish that it existed somewhere so that for those of you who have no earthly idea what I'm talking about, I could at least send you to it so you could hear what it was like. But it's completely gone. It's been taken completely down um, by Minnesota Public Radio. But 
the short version is the writer's almanac was a daily show that garrison keeler had that was syndicated nationwide it's about five minutes long and he would come on and do a little bit of literary history and cultural history for every day of the year and end with a poem and it was a very grounding part of my week i can tell you that and it's gone and so some of my thought process was okay if i were going to do a writer's almanac what would it look like what would I do in this particular space? And that's part of what season two came from is that sort of thinking. And part of it came from me coming back to my passion. I don't do New Year's resolutions, but I am for the first time in my life doing a word for the year. And my word for 2018 that kept coming back to me was home, that this is a year to remember what fuels me and what grounds me. And there are years for going forward and there are years for not pulling back, that's the wrong way of putting it, but there are years for being rooted and um, establishing a grounding spot. And home was the word that I kept coming back to. I felt like I needed to come home on this show as well to something that was very familiar, something that I knew I could do, something that I knew I could sustain, and something that I would be passionate about. The answer, as has been the answer in my life so many times, was books. The title for season two is Right Book, Right Time, and it comes directly from, so I'm a librarian by training, which means I actually have a master's degree in library and information science. Yes, that is totally a thing. And on your first day of your graduate degree of master's in library and information science, you sit in a classroom and they tell you about a guy named Ranganathan. Ranganathan is the father of library science. I think every discipline has a father out there somewhere. He was sort of the guy who sat down and codified what public library service looks like. And there were five laws of library science. And the first one is every book its reader, which means that for everything created out there, every book, every piece of media, there is somebody who's searching for it. Um, we shouldn't judge things by their popularity because they are all for someone and they will all find their someone. The second one is every reader his book which is sort of the flip side of that, that there is no such thing in this world as a library patron who can't be served by some piece of information, some piece of media, some piece of material that we have. It's our job to find it, even for our most challenging people. And there are other laws, too. The library is a growing organism and things like that. But those two laws, those first two laws, form the core of what librarians call reader's advisory, which is the art of connecting people with books and books with people. And they also lay the groundwork for the librarian's fight against censorship and all the rest. So my title of my second season, Right Book, Right Time, comes right from Ranganathan and comes right from my own life. Because what I wanted to do, this is something I kind of stole from Nancy Pearl, Nancy Pearl is the world's most famous librarian. She's literally an action figure. Um, she worked at the Seattle Public Library for a long time and has made a name for herself also on NPR, talking about books as well as writing books about books. And she has a novel out now, but her first two books were Book Lust, which is basically a list of wonderful books for different readers. And I took Nancy's class in grad school and she said... The instant that Book Lust came out, she immediately had this long, long list of books that weren't in it. And she thought, how could I have forgotten this and that and such and such and so and so. And she really wanted to call the second book in the series Book Lust to the morning after um, <laughs> because it had that same feeling of regret. Her publishers didn't like that so much. So book two is actually more Book Lust. And then her third one is Book Crush, which is her book about children's NYA literature. So um, Nancy's famous for those books. She's famous for recommending books. It's really fun to hear Nancy talk about books. If you never have, please just Google her and listen. To I love the way she says the word book. It's hilarious. So she's she's on our local public radio station here, KUOW. You can find her archives on their website. I am certain she's not the writer's almanac. She hasn't disappeared. But Nancy talks about book lust not as a professional resource for librarians or as a fun experience in reading for readers, which it is, both of those things, she talks about book lust as her love letter to books. It is very personal. It is about the things she has read and she has loved that have touched her. And that was something I could relate to. So when I go into the second season, it is not meant to be a to-do list for you. It is not meant to be a, oh my gosh, Chris is going to give me a new book every week that I have to read. I can't fit that into my life. I'm going to pick a book every week that has touched me 
as a reader, and as a human being. And I'm going to dive a little bit into it, who wrote it and why and what impact it had not just on me, but on everybody on the world, whether that's big or small, and do a little bit of writer's almanac on those books. And if you want to read them, awesome. I'll definitely give you all the links so you can find them. If you don't, if you'd like to just come along on the journey and hear someone talk passionately about books and reading, I hope that you will. Because to me, this is incredibly personal. It's really more of my diary. It's about my life as a reader. Um, my expertise for doing this starts and ends with being a reader, because I think any reader can and should talk passionately about the books that have impacted them. The rest of my resume, I'm a librarian, I'm a writer, I'm a mom. And so I do think I have a little bit of expertise to pull from in terms of how I talk about books and how I talk about reading. But I, at the beginning and the end, am a reader who's here to tell you how books have impacted my life. And we're going to talk about all kinds of books. If you're starting to get scared and you're starting to be ready to hit unsubscribe because you think I'm going to give your to-be-read pile a huge boost, please don't. Honestly, one of the books that's on the short list for talking about pretty early on is Where the Wild Things Are, which is, I think, less than 600 words long. So we're going to talk fiction, nonfiction, children's books, classic books, books you've heard of, books you've never heard of, books you've read, books you've pretended that you've read. And I really hope that you'll just listen and be inspired and not feel like I'm trying to add more to your already busy and, and overcomplicated lives. A little bit of logistics. This second season is going to live right where the first season has lived. So wherever you're listening to this is where you can get it. It's going to start next Friday. There's not going to be a huge break. Um, if you're not subscribed, please do. It's super easy to do. Um, if you have an iPhone, it has a default podcast app built right in. You can find us there. If you don't like that app, there's a million others you can find. Just go into your... Um, your uh, I don't know what it's called. I have an Android phone. Whatever the store is you buy apps from, go in there and you can pick a free podcast app. If you have an Android phone, you can pick a free podcast app. Or we're also on Google Play Music. You can just Google us and the list of recent episodes. You can just hit play. Or if you like Spotify or, you know, YouTube or wherever it is you find things, you can subscribe to us in all of those places. So if you're not subscribed, I would recommend doing it because that way everything comes right to you. And everything we've already done stays right where it is. So if you have a favorite episode, a favorite story you've heard here, if you're one of our contributors and you want to keep sharing where you were featured, none of that's going anywhere. All of that continues to live. We're just not going to be making new flash fiction episodes for the foreseeable future. I'm really excited about this, you guys. I really am. I don't know if we're going to have 10 listeners or 10,000 listeners. My guess is somewhere in the middle there. Um, but I'm excited to keep coming on and talking to you and bringing um, this show to you. I am anticipating that we are probably going to have guests and do segments and ask for feedback and have specials because we've done all of that in the past. But I'm trying really, really hard not to plan too far ahead on this, to just keep it real and keep it organic and keep interacting with you because that's the fun part. I think what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to take a little bit of the work off my own plate and focus on what to me makes podcasting fun. So we're not doing reviews. We're not turning this into a book blog. I don't have any sponsors who are going to send me free boxes of books. It's none of that. It's just my journey goes on as reader, writer, and podcaster, and I'm inviting you to come with me. That will start Friday, February 2nd, next Friday, here on No Extra Words. Depending on where you listen, it will either show up as episode 101 or as season two, episode one. Um, that just purely depends on how your podcast app reads the data. Both of those are the same thing. You don't have to listen to both. I hope to see you. I hope to see you on all of our social media. We are at No Extra Words everywhere. Instagram, Twitter. Talk to me. Let me know how you feel about these changes. Um, we remain at noextrawords.wordpress.com, which is where you kind of find everything, how to find back episodes and how to subscribe. And if you have any questions, how to find me, who I am, all of that is available over there. So stay tuned. Happy reading. Happy listening, happy writing, or happy just walking through the woods thinking, whatever of those things you are doing today. You guys take care. Thank you so much for celebrating 100 episodes with us. Have a great week.